think my three favorite sounds this morning have been the birds who greeted us as we awoke this morning and entered the worship space. My second favorite sound was Etta beginning worship for us already with her shouts of joy and the music that greets us to worship the risen Christ this morning. I now invite you to join your voices along with me in our responsive call to worship this morning. We know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Christ the Lord is risen. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. Christ is, is risen. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Christ the Lord is risen. Alleluia. Let's stand and sing our praises to the risen Christ. Bye. 
receive the greeting of our God, friends. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Pray with me, please. God, we continue to delight in the good news of your resurrection. That's why shouts of joy and victory continue to resound from this space and mostly from our souls and from our homes where we gather today. God, we ask that you will bless us in this service of worship, that we will commune with you by the Holy Spirit, and that we will be empowered by your Spirit to live as faithful witnesses of the resurrection of the dead as we live our lives in this world and throughout our life. God, come among us by your Spirit. Bless the hearing of your word and bless our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen with me to this word from God from 1 John chapter 1. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and the word has no place in our lives. We gather in this space to do many things. We gather in this space to name God, to be the holy, true, and faithful one who is worthy of our worship. We also gather in this space because we recognize that we are not without sin. 
And if we think we are, we're deceiving ourselves. And so we come before God with that truth in our hearts, asking for Him to forgive us all of our sins. I'll offer a prayer. To know you, a heart to love you, and a will to serve you. But our knowledge is imperfect, our love inconsistent, our obedience incomplete. Day by day, we fail to grow into your likeness. Hear our prayers of confession. Merciful God, in your tender love, forgive us through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Listen for the good news, again from 1 John, now chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Friends, believe this good news and live in its peace. In Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. So kids, I hope you are listening to the anthem that was sung this morning. I thought I had my copy up here, but I think I can remember well enough. Oh, there it is. So, I don't, I, uh, Mrs. Matthews, our choir uh, director, always gives me one of these before they're going to sing so that I know what's coming. I've not yet been invited to take this up there with me yet, and I'm not actually looking for an invitation either. But I, I do appreciate getting these uh, uh, these booklets before uh, they sing the song so that we know what's coming and we can put it in the order of worship where it makes sense and it connects with the rest of worship and they do such a good job of choosing songs to sing. What really struck me with the song that they sang this morning, Holy, True, and Faithful God, was the song that they sang and it was really because this song is a profession of faith. It's a song that professes what we believe. It's a song that helps us to explore who God is, and how God shows up in our life. And the song they sang is he shows up as a holy God. When I think of a holy God, I think of a God who is set apart, a God who is different, unlike anything in all of creation because God is other than creation. And that makes me, the, the word holy makes me think of kind of the color in our sanctuary during the Easter season. So on the screens, the screens are white and our stoles are white and some of the other parchments are white in this space that reminds us of, of God's holiness, that he's set apart and that he's other. He is without sin. And then the word true and faithful, but in particular that word faithful, there's an image that I think we're going to zoom in on so you can see nice and close on my stole this morning. Uh, the top of the stole right here is a rainbow. There's a dove on the stole. There's some water. There's some green. But the rainbow on top is a symbol of God's faithfulness. Because you'll remember maybe that story in the book of Genesis when, when God caused an earth to come on the flood. You remember that, Tad? I see you nodding. God caused a flood to come on the earth because he was so upset about sin and he wanted to clean up the world. And after the flood, dry land appeared and the water went away and then God sent a rainbow in the sky to remind not only Noah and his children and his family but all of creation that he would never again send a flood to destroy the earth. And we can trust that because our God is true. Our God is true. That means we can trust what he says. What God says, he will do because he's true. And that also makes him faithful. We can count on God. He will be there to the very end. That's what the rainbow reminds us of. And so this morning in worship, I love it that the symbols in our space remind us of who God is. The songs that we sing and the words that we hear and the prayers that we offer, they all help us to explore who our God is so that we can live as his children this morning. And we're going to hear about that, how we live as his children uh, during the scripture lesson this morning. And so I hope you at home will be able to listen to that as we dig into God's word together.
Uh, let's, let's ask God's blessing on the rest of our time in worship. God, thanks that we can be together. Uh, thank you that we can worship. We thank you that we can um, hear songs, and that we can see symbols that remind us and cause us to wonder about who you are. Today we marvel over the truth that you are holy. You're different than us. You're, you're set apart. You are without sin, but you're also true and you're faithful. What you say you will do and your faithfulness is shown every time a rainbow shows up in the clouds, every time you keep your word to us, and you've done that most of all in Jesus. And we thank you for him and for the blessing it is that we can gather in his name and learn more about him with each other. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing a song now to prepare ourselves for the hearing of God's word. I invite you to stand and sing along with me. Behave. probably best that since we just named God to be true to his word, I better be true with you right at the outset of the sermon this morning and be honest. This morning's sermon is going to be, at least upon my personal review, just a little bit dense. I think it might get a little bit theologically thick at times, but it's for a purpose. Theology, the classic understanding of theology, Anselm, the 12th century uh, teacher of the faith, said that that Theology is faith seeking understanding. That's what we do every time we come to God's Word. That's what we do every time we take a walk in God's creation and we wonder about Him. Our faith is trying to seek greater understanding of who God is and who our God is calling us to be. So like every Sunday, we're going to do theology up here, but I think this Sunday it might be a little bit thicker than normal. I think it's important for us to do so, to do theology, because... um, This has a big impact, not only in how we understand God, but also on who we understand ourselves to be as as God's image bearers and as his children. And this morning, we're going to dig into a dilemma of the Christian faith that I think all followers of Jesus wonder about as we walk along the way of faith. It's the same dynamic that the Apostle Paul wrestled with in the book of Romans when he says, what I want to do, I do not do. And what I do not want to do, I just keep on doing. Paul and all the rest of us who believe in Jesus are new creations in Jesus Christ. 
uses the words of the Gospel of John and the letters of John, which we'll get to in just a moment, we are born again in Christ. We are new creations in Jesus, and yet sin still seems to have a very real presence in our lives. That's why we keep creating space in all of our worship gatherings, week in and week out, to to confess our sins. Because if we don't, the truth is not in us. Right? If, if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves, we're tricking ourselves, and the truth is not a part of our reality. But if we name our sin, the truth is in us, and then we have an advocate who is interceding for us right before the Father, our great defender, who is Jesus in the presence of the Father, interceding for us every time we offer our prayers of confession. But the question still remains, how do we deal with our sinfulness as we try to live into the full assurance of our salvation in Jesus Christ. We believe Jesus is raised from the dead. For the past two Sundays, two Sundays ago on Easter, last Sunday Pastor Tim was preaching the good news that we are saved by grace through faith because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And because of that, we don't need to fear sin, we don't need to fear death, we don't need to fear the evil one, and yet sin still keeps creeping back into our life. We're called to be an Easter people. We're called to finish the Easter story. And yet so often we find the Easter story incomplete. Sin, on the other hand, how can we enjoy the assurance? The assurance of our salvation. One of the great teachings of the Reformed faith in John Calvin is that there is this perseverance of the saints. That the saints will persevere unto glory because Jesus Christ has us in the grip of His grace. Well, how do we reconcile that and then not take too lightly our sinfulness in our lives, which shows that we are so out of step with living as new creations in Jesus Christ? John's first letter to the churches, not his gospel, but he wrote three letters also to the churches, and his first one, more than any other book in the Bible maybe, seems designed to help us in this very real daily battle that we go through. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, we hear this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that we may know that you have eternal life. This book was written, he says, to help believers like us to have the assurance that we have actually been born again. That Jesus Christ's resurrection is actually the first fruits of the resurrection of those who believe in him right now. John wants us, or maybe I should say it a little bit more accurately, God wants us to experience something in this letter that makes us confident that we have passed from death to life as we still experience sin in our lives. One of those lessons comes from 1 John chapter 3, the first 10 verses. Let's listen together for God's word. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him 
he cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, may your word from 1 John be our rule, your spirit be our teacher, and the glory of the risen Christ who is coming again be our only concern. In his name we pray. Amen. I've got to be honest with you, this scripture lesson that we just heard uh, and the entire uh, epistle of First John seems a little bit back and forth to me. What I mean by that is, is not it's talking back and forth to itself, but what I mean is, it seems like throughout the letter there is this dynamic at play that oftentimes has this kind of mode to it. John will go on these lyrical runs, and they're just wonderful. He'll say things like, God has lavished his love on us, and we are his children. And, and it just feels so, these lyrical runs that he takes us on just make us feel so wonderful. They make us feel loved. They make us feel cared for by our Father in heaven because of his love. And this great defender, Jesus, who's in his presence, advocating for us at every moment. But then you go on these runs, and in 1 John chapter 1, it's about the light. There's this wonderful light, and then all of a sudden, that light ends with the sobering news about darkness. John 3, which we just read, we are on this lyrical run of God's love and we're his children and you know, sin's lawlessness. And then all of a sudden, those who keep on sinning are not in him. Those who are born again do not keep on sinning. And I don't know about you, but when I begin chapter 3, the first few verses, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I'm feeling pretty good that God's lavish love has made me a child and I feel born again, but then I get a little bit deeper into the passage and I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I think I'm born again, but I know I keep on sinning. So does that, mean that, does that mean I'm not a child of God and that I'm not born again? Does that mean I can't be so sure of my salvation? That's why I say it's a little bit back and forth, not because the text is back and forth, but because I live a life that is back and forth. I live a life where I am in Jesus Christ, a child of God. And yet the back and forthness shows up when sin comes into my life still on a daily basis. And that's the dilemma that 1 John and all the book of 1 John helps us dig into. I think to get at it best, we need to know what's going on in the churches that John is writing to to understand this dilemma that he's trying to help us Walk, walk our way through. There were some false teachings going on in the early church. All the early churches had to endure false teachings, and they were different in every context. The churches that John was writing to were dealing with a particular sort of false teacher. One of the false teachings that were coming into the churches that John was writing to was this, and this is where it gets a little theologically dense, so just bear with me for a minute because I believe the plane will land in a very practical sort of way. These false teachers that John was writing to that the churches had experienced were saying that the pre-existent Son of God, what I mean by that is, is the Son of God who was dwelling with the Father and the Holy Spirit in all eternity, that Son of God, before He became incarnate in Jesus Christ from Nazareth, that pre-existent Son of God, Jesus Christ, had not come in the flesh. He only seemed to come in the flesh. That's one of the first heresies of the Christian church. It's called docetism. It comes from the Greek, Greek word dose, which means to seem. The docetists believed that the pre-existent Son of God dwelled in the highest heaven, and then he came down here to earth spiritually, but he only seemed to be in the flesh. 
They didn't believe in the full union of the pre-existent Son of God with a fleshy human nature like ours. Here's what John says about them in the same letter, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. There's a lot we could go into about this false teaching, but I only want to focus on one thing. These false teachers disconnected Christ from the flesh. We see that in verse 2 here. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. These false teachers didn't like that idea of the pre-existent Son of God being united with human flesh. Now here's the reason why that's so important for us today. This view of the person of Jesus Christ not being united to physical, bodily, fleshy existence had a practical effect on the way that the false teachers viewed the Christian life. Just as they disconnected the person of Christ from ordinary physical life, so too they disconnected the Christian from regular physical, ordinary life. Here's the basic nuts and bolts of the docetist teaching. Not only is Jesus, right, the pre-existent Son, only seeming to be flesh down here on earth, but we are only seeming to be flesh when we believe in Jesus because we have been spiritually born again. And so our spiritual born against born againness does not allow us to sin in the spirit we're only sinning in the flesh which is no longer of god okay i know that sounds really convoluted but there were a lot of believers in the first century who started to go this way which means that lawlessness when it comes to how we live our life after we give our life to jesus doesn't really matter because we can't sin in the spirit just as jesus was not in the flesh when we believe in jesus christ the docetists say we no longer are in the flesh we are just seeming to live in the flesh at least that's how the teaching was showing up in the church and john and other leaders recognized that and first of all, John doesn't get into this, but we believe, as Paul does, that Jesus was not only raised from the dead, we don't believe he was just spiritually raised from the dead. We believe Jesus, as Paul says, was physically raised from the dead. And we want him to be physically raised from the dead because it means that we are not only spiritual beings, but we are still fully embodied beings. And we will rise to new life spiritually and physically either when he calls us home, and most of all, when Jesus Christ returns from glory to make all things new. We believe in a bodily resurrection from the dead. One of the clearest places we see this in our lesson this morning is in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, where John says, Dear children, let no one lead you astray. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, just as he that is, Christ is righteous. What's John saying here? He's saying, be aware of these false teachers. Because what they say is that you can be righteous and not practice righteousness. In other words, John opposes not only their view of Christ, that they disconnect from the flesh, but he also opposes their view of the Christian life. The Christian life is meant to live in the flesh. Yeah, we have been redeemed spiritually, but we have been redeemed bodily too in Jesus' physical death, in Jesus' physical resurrection, in His physical reappearance when He comes again to make all things new and to redeem the physicality 
of this creation that he so loves. That's who our God is. And he calls us as his image bearers to go out as physically embodied beings to live our life faithfully in this world. And so this is the latest I've ever done this. Way too late to let Kim know on Friday, to let Rachel know this morning. But this morning as I was going through my sermon, I became discontented with, my, with, with the title of this sermon. Pastor Tim and I were talking with Kim last week about, I think she was hunting for a sermon title from Tim, and Tim said, you know, sermon titles, you know, they're, and I would agree with this, they're, they're, they're pretty much just for people who get the bulletin. We don't even give bulletins anymore, right? We put it up on the screen. We don't, I don't pay a ton of attention to sermon titles. Pastor Tim said he doesn't. Kim likes to get them, so we work at getting them to her because it makes her and us get along well together, right, in the office. But as I was thinking about this sermon title, my whole point of this sermon title was keep on, right, keep on living the Christian life and not keeping on sinning. That's what I thought I was coming in here to preach this morning. But I came up with a different idea as I was going through this this morning. I want to change this sermon title from keep on not keeping on to this. Keep on keeping on. Here's what I mean by that. Keep on keeping on in the Christian life. Keep on keeping on in the Christian life. Why? Because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. He's been raised bodily from the dead for you and for me. And because He has been raised, our salvation, if we believe in Jesus Christ, should never be in question. We should never question our salvation. The perseverance of the saints is absolute. Absolutely true. Jesus Christ has been raised, and God will persevere a faithful remnant, His church, until the very end when Christ returns to take us all home and the kingdom will be fully established. That's the perseverance of the saints testified to throughout Scripture. Keep on keeping on even when you recognize sin in your own life. I do not believe that 1 John says, that Christians will be sinless. Because why in chapter 1 would we hear the call to confession, right? Those who do not believe they sin deceive themselves and the truth is not in us. We're called in this very letter to name our sinfulness before God. And what are we called to do with our sinfulness? Well, we got to that in chapter 2 when it says take it to the advocate. Take it to our great defender, who is Jesus Christ, who's in the presence of God the Father right now, interceding for us when we confess our sins to God, week in and week out in this space, in our homes, or every day during the week when we recognize that we have messed up and we have not lived the way that God has called us to live, we got to keep on keeping on. we got to keep putting one step in front of the other as we follow Jesus, even when sin creeps back into our life. St. John calls us to recognize that we have been born again. We are new creations in Jesus Christ. And that doesn't give us permission to go out and just sin lawlessly. We are to keep on keeping on, naming our sins before God, and giving the Holy Spirit something to work with day in and day out so He can keep sanctifying us as we keep walking with Jesus along the way. we got to keep on keeping on as we live this back and forth nature of our faith. Where at one moment, we hear the good news that we have been born again because Jesus died and rose again from the grave for you and me, for our, for our salvation. God has lavished His love upon us once again in the words of assurance. And we feel like children of God. Every time we do a new members class around here, we do these, um, these steps of saying to introduce ourselves to each other, I am. And you can get as serious or as unserious as you want as you walk through it as a way of introducing ourselves. And every single time that Pastor Tim introduces himself, the first thing you say is, I am a child of God. Right? And that's a wonderful gift and a wonderful assurance to us of who we are. We recognize ourselves to be a child of God, so keep on being a child of God. Keep the faith. 
Stay in the Word. Stay connected to Christian community. Allow the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection to keep flooding your soul day in and day out. And when sin creeps back into your life and you wonder to yourself, am I still a child of God if I keep on sinning? Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world, John says. But then keep striving. Not through your own power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep in step with the Holy Spirit as you keep walking with Jesus along the way. Be assured of your salvation. If you believe Jesus is raised from the dead, you too will be raised from the dead in God's good future. But don't let that lead to lawless living because God is going to raise us physically just like Jesus Christ was. And so we need to keep living physically in this world faithfully before our God. So whatever sin keeps on creeping into your life, name it before God and pay attention to it. Pay attention to it and ask God to give you the strength to fight against it and then when it creeps back into your space, fight against it and ask God in Jesus' name to help you every step along the way. Keep on keeping on, brothers and sisters, as you are assured of your salvation when you name your sins before God and as you are called to live faithfully before Him in this world as His beloved children that He has lavished His love upon in Jesus Christ our Lord. Keep on keeping on as you... Oh, it's been changed. Nicely done, Rachel. I'm just going to leave it at that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. God, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Help us to name it. Help us to not be overcome by our sin. Help us to live faithfully in this world before you as we follow you along the way, not becoming lukewarm, not by becoming complacent, but becoming more energized by your Holy Spirit to live faithfully before you every step we take. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to welcome you to worship this morning, whether you're here or whether you're online with us this morning, we're glad that you joined us to worship Almighty God. Following our service this morning at 11 o'clock, we start a new three-week series with Dr. David Stubbs. David is the uh, professor of ethics and theology at Western Seminary, and he'll be sharing some insights from his book, um, temple and Table. In this book, and, and I'll tell you, there's a couple of books out there, and I'll just confess, it's not an easy read. Um, but if you like the Old Testament, you'll love David in terms of the teaching that will come out during this three weeks as we learn about uh, the temple. And if you like the New Testament, 
you'll love that he takes the Eucharistic practice and, and folds those, uh, the temple worship and um, the Eucharist into um, a way that uh, will help us all understand. So this will, this will be a, a, a great class and I hope that you'll join us. You can find that link in the call to worship. Maybe in the call to worship this week you saw that we're starting a new all uh, abilities team um, similar to the Whitney House, um, a sub-team of the All Abilities group. And <laughs> these folks will, um, will start partnering with a new house, Grace House. There are six men in this house, just like at Whitney House. There are six men. And we're looking for six to eight individuals who will plan four to six events a year, celebrate birthdays, uh, begin to shape those relationships. I went over, I've met these men, um, I think that, uh, that you'll, uh, if you decide to become a member of this team, um, you'll enjoy them. Um, I'll, I'll, there will be no boredom. That's what I'm going to tell you. There will be no boredom with these guys. There's lots of energy in this home. Um, so if you are interested in uh, finding out more or being part of that team, um, then please let me know. And, uh, or, or talk to David Graham and we'll get you signed up uh, on that team. Stephen Exo, Exo is going to come forward and talk about another effort that's underway. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to invite all of you again uh, to join us at Fran Hill Ranch August 9 through 13 for a week of friendship camp uh, which is their program for adults with intellectual disabilities. Uh, this Tuesday at 7 p.m. via Zoom, we'll have an informational meeting uh, for anyone interested in, in volunteering and coming along on this trip. Uh, we'll share some information about uh, your options for the week, about housing, about you know what a day in the life of Cranhill looks like, and answer any questions, concerns you guys have. Um, and I, and I want to provide a, a correction for something that, that I know I said at some point when sharing about this event. I said that if you wanted to help out with Friendship Camp, you had to be there for the whole week, and that's only partially true. If you are interested in coming for just part of the week, that is an option, but you wouldn't be able to uh, interact directly with the Friendship Campers. You'd be able to help out at a cabin some other ways, help out in the kitchen, housekeeping, groundskeeping, things of that nature. Um, so if you do want to participate in Friendship Camp, it would have to be for the whole week. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, again, that is a meeting Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Uh, if you would like the link for that, talk to me, uh, talk to Pastor Tim, talk to Dave Graham, and we will provide you with that. Thank you. Stephen is going to be uh, the chaplain that week um, during uh, Friendship Camp, and, and I just uh, think it's going to be an exciting week for, um, we have about nine people already uh, signed up to go, um, and, uh, but we welcome more. Remember, mission trip shares for the youth's uh, mission trip, um, those forms are on the table. You can get those as you exit to the outside for a time of fellowship. Um, and, uh, and we're hoping that we can post the available work days uh, if you want to hire youth to come and work at your home. Um, you get a team of five people for two hours, a uh, hundred bucks, and we hope to post those um, later this week. Some prayer updates. Uh, Ray shared that his father, Dick, who fell, broke his hip, and had surgery, is now home from the hospital and recovering. He's weak, uh, but he's doing okay. Uh, I talked to John Beal yesterday. Um, he's back at Blodgett. His treatment has, the gamma treatment um, has been completed. Um, he's hoping uh, to continue to build strength throughout this week. He thinks he's in rehab for uh, seven to, to ten days, and beyond that, they're really not sure what the next step will be. Um, Jim Tellum died this week on Thursday. 
uh, a sad day for all of us, certainly for Faye and for her family. Um, we don't have the details of a memorial service. We will get those to you uh, as soon as they're made available to us. And then uh, Tim Brown returns to Baghdad tomorrow. And so we remember uh, Tim as he returns to his work there um, and uh, for the family that he leaves behind. Let us come before God in prayer. God of hope and promise, as we continue to live into this season of Easter, we are reminded that we truly are the children of God. We are a people of promise and hope, a people who have experienced the love of God lavished upon us through Jesus Christ's sacrifice for our sins. It's because he lived that we have an abundant life offered to us. Increase in us our desire and self-discipline to live faithfully in response for this gift of grace. And in gratitude, let us respond wholly and sacrificially with our own lives. Make strong the Church of Christ. Make strong all the servants of the Church. In our weakness and divisiveness, we pray that we would work toward reconciliation and a shared mission. Equip us so that by being led by your Spirit, the righteousness of God will be lived out in us and through us. May the compassion of Christ be witnessed in many and various ways to all those who are in need and all who have yet to claim you as their Lord and Savior. God, we are thankful for Stan and Mary, Matt and Lynn, who have served faithfully as elders and deacons over these past three years. Now prepare the lives of Mark and Sherry, Beth and Ray, as they enter their term of service in the coming weeks. But we pray for all of us at Thornapple Church that you will use us in ways great and small to serve others, to share Christ boldly, and that we would be mindful of the opportunities to be hope and light in this world. We pray for the brokenness in this world, for the division between people, the fear of violence, the lack of resources. We pray for those cities that are on edge following shootings this past week, for towns that face the devastation of storms, destroying homes and businesses, taking lives, and left a spirit of hopelessness. God, we pray for peace. We pray for your mercy to be poured out. Bring healing to the sick, strength to the weary, and comfort to all who mourn. We remember Faye and her family this day as they begin to mourn the death of Jim. We are mindful of so many other families that are in this same place. Bring them comfort. We are grateful that you have um, continued to work through the treatment for John Deal, for the surgery that Lucini had, and Yvonne Allen, and Dick Jorgensen, and Mike Peterson. Continue to be with them as, as they continue to need strength and healing. We pray for Stan Grunsky as he continues a series of tests and procedures in the coming weeks. For Arlen Sawyer and Nancy Myers, we give thanks for the measure of the healing that you continue to bring to their bodies. And, oh God, bless over Tim Brown as he returns to his work in Baghdad and grant him safety. Now hear us as we pray silently for others. Keep renewing our spirits by your spirit and put the joy of Christ in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Friends, keep on keeping on, and may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be and abide with each of you, now and forever.